Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Have you ever been surprised about how someone turned out? I probably should explain it. It's kind of a weird way to say it. Uh, maybe someone you knew in elementary school that as you grew up with them, maybe they were the undersized kid in elementary school, but now they're like the captain of the football team in high school. Or, or maybe it's that um, super intelligent guy who wore glasses, pocket protector in, in high school and, and goes off to college and now is uh, a stylish captain of industry. Uh, usually you find those things out when you go to your high school reunion. Um, so has anybody been to a high school reunion? I know some of y'all are not yet there, but yeah, so several years back, I, I should, yeah, I guess I'll be honest. Several years back, I went to my 20-year high school reunion, and you know, I was surprised by everybody there. Last time I'd seen most of those guys, they um, was graduation, so it was kind of weird to think of them as parents and having real jobs and responsibility. I was like, I never would have guessed that. And of course, when they looked at me, they would have never have guessed that I would be a pastor today. You know, who would have thunk way back then? Um, so that's, uh, yeah. And if you think that picture's awesome, the, the, uh, that's my senior year. My junior year, my, my wa- mom has one picture of me that she carries in her wallet. And the picture that she has is, uh, now, this is the 80s. So um, I had a perm, a mullet, a mustache, and a gold chain. <laughs> it was awesome. But um, and as embarrassing as that picture is, I can't deny that it happened because my mom still carries that one picture, and thankfully we didn't find it this week. <laughs> See, when y'all laugh, I always look up there because I'm like, did they find it? Okay. But today as we continue our story in the book of Acts, we're going to find that Saul's buddies, his friends, are surprised at the transformation that happens for him as well. Please turn to Acts chapter 9 and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house and to worship you. And, Lord, I thank you for Steve and for his story and uh, the way that you have worked in his life, not only as a teenager to bring him to faith, but um, the people you bought, brought in his life who have, who have challenged him and have pointed him back to you and how you're using him today and for the ministry there with Taylor's heart to, to the orphanage in in Mexico. And Lord, we think about the, the folks that right now are um, facing the devastation of a hurricane and, and lives that are turned upside down. Lord, we just pray for the loss of life and we pray for uh, loss of belongings and, and just the disruption there that, Lord, that you would allow your church to, to rise up and, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to care for those uh, who, knew, who need to, to be reminded of a hope that we have that's beyond this world. And Lord, as we look at the story of Saul, I pray that, Lord, you would just encourage our hearts, that you would challenge us, and that, that, that we would be um, just as uh, passionate about sharing your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at verse 19. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Last week, Saul had an encounter with Jesus and his whole life was changed. And not only was his life changed, but as we continue to go through the book of Acts, we're going to find that that God is going to use Saul as his primary instrument of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. That through the, the uh, churches that Saul will plant in Asia Minor and Europe, uh, through his writings, uh, his, his letters that he'll write to churches, that Saul, who become the Apostle Paul, will have a, a monumental impact on the kingdom. 
Now Saul had come into Damascus, and, and the whole goal there when, when he came was to, to persecute uh, the followers of the Lord. And now we find him in the temple or in the synagogue praising and proclaiming the name of Jesus with the same folks that he was there to persecute. He calls out, he says, Jesus is the cry or is the Son of God. And that statement there is a reference to Psalm chapter 2 where David, it's a messianic psalm, where David talks about the Messiah and this special relationship that God the Father would have with his Messiah, and that it would be this father-son relationship. At this point, uh, he's, not, he's not trying to say Jesus is God. He's saying he has a special relationship with God that only the Messiah would have. Now, we know, looking back through time, that, that, that what Paul says here is also true, uh, it's a big word, but it's called an ontological sense, in that Jesus literally is God's Son. He is fully God. We worship a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. And at this time, he's saying, this is the guy. And Saul, of course, is fully convinced. Now, the folks that knew Saul, that, that, that uh, knew he was coming for a specific purpose, they're a little bit uh, confused and actually amazed Because see, Saul came for the express purpose, like he was breathing out threats. He was ready to kill people. He was the guy that in Jerusalem had persecuted the church, who was like a wild animal devouring everybody in his way. But now this guy who was so adamantly anti-Jesus is pro-Jesus. The question is, what happened to Saul? What happened? What, how did he go from this, this tyrant who's trying to destroy to this, this person who's trying to defend? And the answer is that Saul had a destiny-changing impact encounter with Jesus. And Jesus changed everything. Earlier, Jesus had appeared to the capital A apostles, showing them many convincing proofs that he it was and is alive. Remember that 40 days uh, during the time after his resurrection until his ascension, he's there and he's teaching the apostles. Now, why is it important that they're convinced that Jesus is alive beyond any shadow of a doubt? Because they will be his witnesses. Right, That they're going forward. And so for them to go forward and to proclaim the gospel, for them to go forward and tell folks about Jesus, that, that there can be no doubt in their mind that they're proclaiming the hope that there is in a resurrected Christ. And so Saul, after his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, he is so convinced that Jesus is the Christ. Why? Because he got to come face to face with the living Jesus that he goes back to the synagogue and he begins to argue with the folks there. And he is so convincing in his arguments, it says they're confounded, that they're left with nothing to say. It's not surprising because as a Pharisee studying under Gamaliel, Saul would have been a formidable opponent. There would be few people who knew the Old Testament like Saul did. He was an expert in the Old Testament law and in the Old Testament scriptures. He knew it backwards and forwards. Part of his training would have been memorizing large sections, if not whole books of the Old Testament. And we already know he's zealous, right? We already know he was one who was persecuting the church because he felt like he was defending God's honor. Right, that that's the reason he was persecuting. So, so you combine those two things: this great learning and this great zeal. And what what Saul would do is he would take that, and he would use it as a weapon to fight his opponents. What we're going to find out is Jesus takes that those same things and use them as a tool to build his church. Saul was a guy who didn't like to lose. He was a guy who who was rarely, if ever, picked last. Saul was a guy who was on the, fr- on the cunning edge of things. And we'll see that Saul is, is um, kind of like dynamite, right? Lots of power in a small package. Saul's transformation is pretty incredible, right? He goes from persecutor to preacher. He goes from a fiend to a follower, from a foe to a friend. He, comes, he goes from being a one who's obstructing, one who's trying to stop, to a driver of the church. 
Jesus changed everything for Saul. So when you think about your life, how has Jesus changed it? It's during this time in Damascus that Saul is there, we're told, many days. But during this time is likely when he actually makes a trip down to Arabia, to the desert. And he goes there uh, to spend some time alone with the Lord. Now, what do you think he did during his time alone with the Lord? What might he do? Pray. Good. What else might he do? Spend time in the Word. Good. That he's, when he goes down to spend this time with the Lord, he is meditating on God's Word. Again, he, he has large sections of it already memorized, but he's beginning to ask the question, okay, how does Jesus fit into the picture? How do I plug him in to each and every one of these, every promise and every prophecy? How does he fit? How does he fit this symbol that, that Saul, with his great learning, is beginning to say, aha, this is how it fits. This is where... Jesus fulfills this. And it's good for us to remember that, that um, for Saul, this is a time of preparation. Just like Moses had time in the wilderness. Just as Elijah had time in the wilderness. Just as Jesus had time preparing himself uh, to, to minister. That this is a time of preparation for Saul. For the journey that God's going to take him on. And it's also good to remember that the Old and New Testament, they're inextricably, that's a hard word to say, woven together. Right? You can't have one without the other. They, they both go together. If you want to understand God's story, the, the story he's been telling of creation, fall, redemption, recreation, you can't have that story and just start in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus didn't just show up someday on a dusty road in Jerusalem and say, you know what, I think I'm going to die for these people. Right? That that goes all the way back to where? Genesis chapter 3, 15. Right? That's when the promise is made that one day he would come. Right? And in the old, whole Old Testament, Jesus is the one who fulfills it. So uh, everything he says, everything he does, all rooted in the Old Testament. He walks right out of the Old Testament onto the stage. And Saul, an expert in the Old Testament. He has a deep and rich understanding of the Old Testament. When Saul writes his letters, he's not just making stuff up. Going, you know, I think this would be fun to put down there. But he comes from a place of, of this deep and rich understanding. And he's saying, how it, does Jesus fulfill all this? And that's what Paul presents to us in his writings. When Saul returns to Damascus... I'm sure he has great expectations of the positive kingdom impact he's going to have. You know, he, he came in to persecute, now he's ready to preach. And he's, he's excited, he's spent the time studying, everything's making sense to him, and he's ready to go. And what happens when he gets into town? He faces the same thing that the apostles faced. The same thing that Stephen faced. The same thing that Jesus faced. The same thing that every prophet of the Lord has faced. Everyone who has done the work of God, who has followed God seriously, every one of them has faced the same thing. And Paul will be no different. It's a little thing we call persecution. And unfortunately, the, the, the more religious the person is, the greater the persecution um, because they, they feel like their faith is being challenged, even though those who follow the true God, there's only one way and there's only one truth. Saul is going to be no different. He's going to, he finds out about a plot to kill him. And so some buddies of him are going to take him out of town, and we find out that Jesus tells the truth, right? Because in Acts chapter 9, through, the, through Ananias, Jesus had said to, to Paul, or to Saul at that time, he said that, that uh, I will show him how much he must suffer for me. And so already Saul has gone from persecutor to persecutee, 
right? And that huge spiritual impact he thought he was going to have when he got into Damascus, it's going to have to wait. God's still preparing him for the work he has for him. Let's take a look at verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So Paul leaves Damascus and he heads to Jerusalem. Now when he's heading to Jerusalem, no doubt again, he's expecting that he's going to get a warm welcome. Right? He's trusted in Jesus. And that should be good news to the folks in Jerusalem, right? I'm on your team. And he's expecting right away to get to work. Right away. He wants to get busy. But what happens? He, he's met with kind of the stiff arm, right? All of a sudden, like Ananias, the folks at Jerusalem are kind of going, uh, Saul? You mean um, Saul of Tarsus? Is that the guy you're talking about? He wants to come join our church? I mean, he's the guy who, who, who put my buddy in prison. He's the guy who dragged off my, my, my sister to jail. He's the one who persecuted the church. That's the guy you're talking about? Saul? He wants to be a part of our church? I mean, Jesus can save anybody. But Saul? Are you kidding me? The question is, who's the Saul in your life? Who is that person that you, uh, if you were to hear they were a believer today, you would go, are we talking about the same person? Right? That guy? Who is that? And maybe that's you. Maybe you're the one that, that people would be shocked at. Because, and maybe you yourself would be because you think you're so far gone. But remember, no one is so lost they can't be found. Right? No one's so blind they can't see. There's no one so dead that Jesus can't resurrect him to life. No one's too go- far gone for him. Enter Barnabas. You guys probably remember him. Back in Acts chapter 4, Barnabas uh, is the one who sold some property, brought the proceeds to the apostles, right? He was the first to contribute to the cause. Uh, His name means son of encouragement, and we sure see it here. Question is, what would have happened if Barnabas didn't welcome Saul in? What would have become of Saul if there were no Barnabas? Right? What would Saul have done if he was continually left out of the church? What would Saul, who, what would he be doing today? What would Saul, what would happen to Saul without Barnabas? And here we see another person that God uses in Saul's life, another brother who comes alongside him, just like Ananias did. Now Barnabas does, and welcomes Saul into the church. That's a, that's a very important thing. You know, uh, and I hope that in your life there is a Barnabas who's encouraged you. My guess is there is. Someone who brought you in even as a new believer who welcomed you in, who who began to to challenge you. You know, we, uh, several weeks ago, Matt Garino had had shared his his testimony, a dramatic story of how God rescued him. And after uh, Matt had gotten out of prison, he spent some time for consequences for decisions he made. Uh, I remember that he was working 
and I think it was refrigeration or something, but he was in, a, in the secular world. He was working at a job. And Ricky, his friend, his buddy, the guy on staff, had started talking to him and inviting Matt to help out with the youth, getting him plugged in. And lo and behold, a few months or so after that, Ricky told me and told us uh, that uh, he thought it would be a good idea to bring him on staff as an intern. Who would have thunk, right? Matt, the guy who just got out of jail? Him? Is that the one you're talking about? And if you were to look at his ministry today, if you were to talk to, to youth today, if you were to talk to high schoolers and, and junior hires about Matt Garino and the impact he's had on their lives, it's astounding. It's astounding. And it's because a guy named Ricky Hemi came alongside him, put his arm around him, and welcomed him into the church. Who is that in your life? Who is it that you need to come alongside and welcome them in? And what kind of impact does God want to have through them? Like Stephen, Saul faces off with the Hellenistic Jews. All right, these are the same folks that probably gave him permission to go and persecute the church. So you can imagine they're a little bit ticked off at Saul. Right? He had one job. Go take care of these guys. And what does Saul do? He becomes one of those guys. And so they're not happy with Saul. And what are they trying to do? The same thing they tried to do with Stephen, or they did with Stephen. They're going to kill him. Now Saul, guess what? He's two for two. Two places he's gone. Two places he gets death threats. Two places he gets run out of town. And just like what happened in uh, Damascus. Now uh, some other believers are going to help him escape down to Caesarea and he's going to go then to his hometown of Tarsus. And for eight years, eight years, Saul will be on the sidelines. Until in Acts chapter 11, a guy named Barnabas, the same guy, will come, to, come around and say, hey Saul, come on, it's time to get in the game. Now we're told that when Saul departs, that, that the, the capital C church, the, the church in, in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria, that big C church, now has a, a time of peace. And we can easily think, well, Saul must have been quite a troublemaker if when he leaves it's, it's peaceful. But here's the thing. It's not that persecution stopped when Saul left. Church is still being persecuted, but what's the key to their peace? The key to their peace is they're being built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Right? That that's where their peace comes from. It's not a circumstantial peace. It's not because everything's going hunky-dory in their life. It's a peace that transcends circumstance. A peace that transcends understanding. It's a peace that can only come from Jesus, and the church continues to increase. Saul goes from being a persecutor to a preacher. Jesus has changed everything. He passed from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the sun. He has forgiveness of sins, and his destiny will never be the same. That's good news, isn't it? Every time Jesus does that, it's good news. And what should have been good news for Saul is met with disdain by his one-time friends turned enemies. And it's met with doubt by his one-time enemies turned friends. Right? That Saul is caught right in the middle between one group, the, his past and, and those folks, and in the new group over here, he's stuck right here. Except for a guy named Barnabas who welcomes Saul into the church. And I love Saul's zeal. He can't wait to tell people about Jesus. He can't wait to get in there and mix it up. Jesus has so radically changed everything for him. He's got to tell somebody, even when he's facing persecution, even when there's death threats on his life. It doesn't matter. That Saul is going to be a faithful witness, a faithful uh, preacher of the gospel, no matter what trial is going to come for him. Part of that is the way Saul is wired, no doubt. 
But a big part of that is the time that Saul spent in the desert. A big time, a part of that is the time that, that Saul spent alone with the Lord, and the time he spent in prayer and in the Word, the time that he spent uh, fueling the fire in his relationship with God. And some of you may be like Saul. And you might be new to the faith and, and there's this excitement and this anticipation of how God wants to use you and how He wants to have an impact on His kingdom with your life. And, and all you can see almost is roses and, and you get in there and, and, and here's the thing. that You'll find the old group don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, right? Because you've left that way of life. And a new group, they have a hard time accepting you, right? He's a believer or she's a believer. Wait a minute, do you know what they used to do? How in the world could they be a believer? But just like Saul be encouraged. Don't give up, right? Spend time in God's Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time deepening your Christian walk. Find those believers who will welcome you in and encourage you. And the other thing is be patient. Saul's greatest impact will come years later. There's a time of preparation uh, that, that even though a switch was flipped right then, that, that it's going to take time to prepare even the great apostle Paul to have the impact God wants him to have on the world. Are you like Barnabas? An encourager who comes alongside people, a person who welcomes people in. You know who you are. right? And more importantly, those around you who know you well know who you are. Please keep doing what you do. Right? That we need those encouragers. We need those who do it because that's how they're gifted and that's what they naturally do. But that doesn't take the rest of us off the hook, right? Because we're all to be a Barnabas to someone else. We're all to come alongside. Discipleship isn't just me, my Bible, and a cup of coffee, right? There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. We're not to walk the path by ourselves. Paul often talks about the, the church being a body, being a building, that he, he's trying to express the interconnectedness, the interdependence that we have on each other, that we are to bear each other's burdens, encourage each other, love each other. Every fruit of the Spirit it can only happen when there's another person. And so who is that that you need to encourage? When you come into this room and you look around, who is it that's on the fringes? Who is it that's sitting by themselves? Who can you walk up and just say hi? Because you never know the person that you're encouraging. Maybe someone that God wants to use to, to, to impact his kingdom in a phenomenal way. Like a guy named Saul. Or a guy named Matt. And maybe you're here today and you don't yet know Jesus. You might be one of those Saul-type characters that you are so quickly running the opposite way away from him that you think there's no way that he could save someone like me. There's no way. But that's why we have this story. That's why it's there that we get to see this, this man who was so far from God, although he thought he was close to God, whose life is radically changed by Jesus. You see, it starts with admitting that you're a sinner, right? And we did this last week. I don't have to convince you, right? No? Yes? Okay. You're a sinner, right? Every one of us. Right? We even have a phrase, to err is what? Human, right? To err is human. Uh, philosophers know that. We are all sinners, every single one of us. So it just starts with raising your hand and go, yes, I'm a part of the human race. That's me. I'm a sinner. Right? And if you can admit that and say, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved, then you're well on your way. 
Because you recognize it. You recognize that your life isn't working out the way you hoped it would. You recognize that that things are way messier than you could have anticipated. You recognize that that all around you, when you try to do good, it's only bad comes about. You know that. I don't have to convince you of that. And if you've admitted that, then it's simply saying, I need help. And knowing that Jesus came for that specific purpose purpose right he 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 came he eternal god takes on human flesh walks on this earth lives a perfect life and then he dies a sacrificial death he dies in our place he takes all of that sin all that you've done and places it on himself and then he dies And then the third day, he's resurrected, showing that he had conquered sin and death. That it no longer has the power that it did before. That there is salvation and there is rescue and that what God promised truly can come about if you believe. And you can have forgiveness of sins and a new purpose in life. And you'll have forever with him. Now, if you haven't done that before, What are you waiting for? Right? Do you think your life's just somehow going to get better? Somehow you're going to, I don't know, hit the lottery and that's going to make everything go away? What are you waiting for? If you'd like to trust in Jesus today, we're going to have some folks that are available at the end of the service that would love to talk to you about it. And for the rest of us, who do you need to share your story with? Right, And when I said that, whatever name that was that first came to your mind, that one. Not going, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to talk. Let's pick a different one. No, that one. I want you to talk to that one. The one you think is too far gone. The one you think that will never come to faith. That's the one. And all of us have a story. If we've trusted in Jesus, you were dead, now you're alive. What happened in the middle? That's your story. You were lost and now you're found. What's your story? What's the middle part? Jesus changed everything. Right? Who do you need to share your story with this week? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for just this story of Saul. And Lord, we know the impact that he will have and he has had on on many, 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 many lives throughout the, the centuries, Father, and in our own church. And, Father, how you use this man to change the world. And, Lord, we thank you for a Barnabas who came alongside and at the right moment encouraged him and pointed him to you. I thank you, as Steve was sharing, that the many people in his life who, who took a chance and, and pointed them Point him to you. And for Matt and for Ricky's willing to come alongside him. Father, so many different stories where where one believer has taken a chance to welcome another one in, to encourage them and come alongside them. And and the work that you're doing that's truly is incredible. Lord, I pray for those who are in that soul stage right now where they feel like maybe they're between two tribes, the, the folks they used to hang out with and the folks that they, uh, the new group that they're trying to join and they're, they're stuck in between. Lord, I pray that you would encourage their heart today and I pray that you would bring alongside a Barnabas who would be an encouragement and who would walk alongside them to welcome them in. And Lord, I pray for those encouragers out there. I pray that they would continue to do that. And that for all of us, we would look for opportunities, not only to share our story with those who are lost, but to encourage those who know you. And Lord, for anyone who doesn't know you here today, I pray today would be a day where they see their need, recognize it, believe that Jesus 
can save them and trust him to do so. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.